Hi everyone, my name is Rafael Delio, and even though I've been working with Kotlin for a couple of years, there's still so much that I don't know and a lot that I can learn. And because of that, I decided to start this series of videos where I'm going to learn Kotlin publicly with you and filling all these gaps that I know that I'm lacking in my knowledge. All right. So if you know more than me, please, I encourage you to use the comment section of this video to correct anything that I say wrong. And if you don't know that much yet, don't forget to check the comment sections to learn with people that know more than us. All right. Let's build a healthy community where everybody can learn Kotlin together. And the scope of this video today is actually Kotlin scope functions. And before we get started, let me just change the scene here on OBS. All right, I'm sharing my screen now, or at least I should be. And I'm already going to tell you that this video is also available as an article on Medium. If you prefer to read instead of watch, I totally understand you. So the link to this article is going to be in the description. Don't forget to check it out. And besides that, here on the side, I have IntelliJ open. We're going to be working together on IntelliJ coding together and seeing the results in real time. So let's start from the very beginning, understanding what are scope functions. So when you think of a scope, what comes to my mind is actually those things that pirates use to focus on something, right? To see something far away. In Kotlin, it's not that different. And you can see that these functions, they're called on an object. And then within the scope of that function, you can access the object without its name. So from my interpretation, it's a way of focusing on an object and saying everything that is happening inside this context is related to this object here. He's the main actor. He's the main character inside this context. And then we have five of these scope functions, let, run, with, apply, and also. And you're going to get started with the first one, that is the let function. And there's probably also the most controversial one. All right, let me change here now to the left side of the screen. Let me zoom in a little bit and let's understand when you should use it, right? So you should use the let function when you want to perform operations on an object and then return a result. And now, so it allows you to define a variable for a certain scope without polluting the outer scope. So that's the main design behind the let function, right? And let's see how we can actually use it. Let me open this block here. I already have something here that I didn't want you to see right now. Perhaps I can leave it here and just close it. Yes, exactly. But we already have a sneak peek for something that I'm going to be talking a little bit later. But let's take a look at this example right here. So we have, let me copy and paste from the right side into the right side. Actually, since I'm using the Kotlin playground on the right side, I'm not even going to use IntelliJ anymore. I'm just going to use medium itself. And you're going to go through my article here, right? Let me zoom in so you can see it very well here. And then you can see that in this example, we initialized a variable called name. And the value of this variable is a string with Kotlin inside and a couple of blank spaces surrounding the Kotlin word. And then what we're going to do is we're going to call let on this variable, right? So you're going to do name.let. We're going to open a block here, and then you're going to do operations in this object and return the result in the end. So that's the idea, right? The idea is that you get an object, you perform operations on it, and then you return the result of these operations using the let function. So take a look. We first start by trimming it. So we start by removing the blank spaces around it. Then we reverse the string. And in the end, we end up with a reversed Kotlin word. So new talk. Let's run this and let's see the result being printed out because we're printing out the result of this operation right here, new talk. And this is when you should be using the let function. But now you may ask me, but Hafa, I heard that you should be using the let scope function when you're dealing with nullable values. And that's true. Most people will tell you that, right? But Every time I heard that, because I've been hearing this since I started working with Kotlin, there would be something tickling in the back of my mind saying, is this so? Is this the actual reason why you should be using the let scope function? And I decided to 
go further, go in depth and understand why it was created, right? Because if it was for dealing with nullable values per se, I would believe they would have chosen a different name, like name dot if dot no, for example, and then you do whatever happens inside. But actually, look at that. I added a fun fact here stating exactly this, that many people believe that the purpose of let is handling nullable values. And even though that's a common use case, that's true, it wasn't specifically designed to handle nullable values. It's a scope function that allows you to create a temporary scope where you can work with an object, perform operations on it, and return a result, right? And then you can see that, it, that we even go further and you go to the history of when this keyword started being used. And it, you, you see here that I write that in many programming languages, the keyword let is used to introduce a new binding or assignment, essentially saying let this variable be equal to this value. So that's the idea, right? We're basically saying let clean main be equal to the result of this operation right here. That's, that's the idea. And of course, it's dynamic, right? You can, and it's versatile. You can use it for other pu purposes as well. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be using it for handling nullable values, but you should know that it's not the main purpose and that you have much more there is much more that you can do using the let function, right? Besides handling the nullable values. All right, wrapping up the let function right now, let's go to the next one, which is the run function, right? And let's read together here that it's similar to the let, but there is a key difference. The object is then accessible within that block without its name or reference. Ah, this is an important thing. And let me show you, I'm gonna show you what, what it means in just one second. I'm not gonna forget, I, I promise you, right? And it is also used when you need to execute a block of code on an object and then return a result. Let me go back to IntelliJ just to read my notes here. Because yes, when to use it, when you want to execute a block of several operations on an object. So that's the idea of the run function, right? And let's see how you can use it. You have here but yes, that's true. I wanted to explain what he meant by what we meant by the object is then accessible within the block without its name or reference, right? Because here, what we do is we have a reference, right? We're using it and we could even rename it to, for example, name or let's say name, inner name. Let's do inner name in reference to inner, to this variable here as inner name now, and the result should still be the same. You see, while with the run function, you don't reference it as it, but as this. And I'm gonna show you why you would want to do that right now. Because in this example, you can see that I defined a data class called user that receives several parameters such as name, email, and age, and then we have some some mocked functions here, which is, is valid, save to database and send welcome in mail. And they always return true just for the sake of the example here. And then you can see that we initialize a user as John Doe and the email is John Doe at example.com. And this is a guy who is 30 years old, right? And then we get this variable and we start a scope function, a run scope function out of it. We open a block around it and or after it and then we perform operations on the user inside this block so we're running several things on the user inside this block so first we check if this is valid if the user is valid then we check we save it into the database and then finally we send and welcome in mail and for each one of them we're returning a string with the result of the operation so user validation failed or fail to save the user to the database, or fail to send and welcome in mail. And this is gonna be the result, this is gonna be set into the result variable right here. Or if we don't have any problems with any of these operations and they return true, in the end, we're gonna have the result as user registration successful. Let's run this and see what happens. User registration successful. I didn't expect anything different, of course, because everything is true right here. So let's change one of them to false 
So now it's going to fail when, it, when we're saving to the database and fail to save user to database. But you can see how our code is more concise when using the run function right here because we're saying, okay, on this user, I want to run this function, this function, sorry. And the result of these functions are going to be, let's say, encapsulated into this variable here, which is the result variable. Right, so this was the RAM function. Okay, and now let's go to the next one, which is the width function. And quoting myself here, the width function is a bit different from let and run because instead of being called on an object, so user.run or name.let, the width takes an object as a parameter. So width and then the parameter of this function is going to be your object, right? So you can access the object directly just like in run, so using the this, and here's an example. Or not, I should change this right here. <laughs> I should remove this from the article. I'm going to do it after I finish recording this video. And let's check on my notes here when you should actually be using the with function. And you can see that you should use it when you want to execute multiple operations on an object without repeating the reference to, the, to that object. And let's see what we have here. So what we have here is a string builder. And then instead of calling string builder dot append multiple times, we're basically saying with a string builder, and then we do everything that it wants to be happened inside the with function. And then in the end, you can finally call string builder dot to a string and print the result. Let's see how it works. Hello world, how are you? Cool, this is working. But now that we've gone through the with function, I'd like to talk about the also and the apply function together. So let's first take a look at the also function and understand when you should be using it, right? So when you want to perform some actions that take the context object as an argument and then return the object. Side effects are the primary use case for also, right? So you want to encapsulate the, the side effect. So when, whenever somebody is looking at your code or even yourself, you know what's actually part of your business logic and what are side effects, for example, logging, right? And the apply function, which we're going to be looking together at the same time, when you should be using it, when you want to configure an object, right? So for example, as you can see here, a database connection. So let's now take a look and understand how we can use both of these escape scope functions. So the database connection is a class that I created here where we're mocking a database connection. We have a host, a port, a connect function and an execute query function, right? And what we're doing is, here is how you would do it and without scope functions, right? We're missing something here, database connection dot execute query and let's say select all from users, copilot is helping me here. Um, but we're populating this database connection object and we're connecting to the database and finally we're executing a query, right? But we don't have to do all of this in that way and all scattered in your code like this, right? We can have a more elegant and concise code by the end by putting everything we learned so far kind of together. So let's have like the database connection object and then apply and we populate the fields with everything that we need to configure this connection. Finally, we call run on the result of the apply and then we connect into the database we do what we have to do, we execute the query, we delete the, all the rows, we drop a table, on a Friday we do whatever we have to do, and then finally we run the side effects, right? And say, okay, database operations completed successfully. And you can see how elegant and concise it is in the end, because instead of doing everything in a scattered manner, and let me even put the, the logging part, here, right, where you don't really know what is part of your configuration, what is part of your business logic, what is part of your side effects. In the end, if you use scope functions, everything is more elegant and concise again, right? Because you can see exactly where you're applying the configuration for the database connection, where you're running the business logic, even though I wouldn't say that connecting is part of the business logic. And finally, your side effects, which is um, the logging of the operation, right? We could even do it differently. We could have, no, let's, let's leave it like that for now. 
All right, so guys, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I certainly did. Scope functions were something that I was already using, but I never had taken the time to actually delve into when to actually use them and leverage them in my code. I will now, and I hope you will too. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, to like it, and to leave comments in the comment section down below. See you around.